As a church, we love to celebrate when a baby comes to church for the very, very first time. And today, Brian and Felicia have their beautiful baby with them. And could you all come up and let's ask a blessing? And uh, Sherry, this is Grandparents Weekend. If Sherry's here, come on up with them, Sherry. I'll let you do the introduction, as a matter of fact. <laughs> What's our church growth plan? Do you remember? Bring one or have one. So they, this, this family's doing their part. Yes. Finally, I'm a grandma. Woo! So exciting. <laughs> I get to join that club. This is my son-in-law, Brian, my daughter, Felicia, and baby Dean. Hey, baby Dean. He's beautiful, isn't he? Thank you, Sherry. Well, I tell you what, we're just thrilled to death to meet this guy. We've been seeing pictures and hearing stories. And uh, so I want you to stretch out your hands towards Dean. Let's just ask a blessing on him. Lord God, thank you for this beautiful baby. Thank you, God, for the joy that he is to his family, to his parents, his grandparents. God, we just pray that you'd fill him up, help him to grow as Jesus grew. In Luke 2, it says he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Uh, we pray, loving God, that you'd bless this family in every possible way, God. And uh, we, we thank you for your great gifts. In Jesus' holy name, all God's people said, amen. amen. Thanks for letting us show Dean off. God bless you, Brian and Felicia. We love that. Hey, I'm wondering about the grandparents here. Who's, who's, the, who's the most prolific grandparent? Anybody got like four grandkids? That's a lot. Can anybody... Uh, Keep your hands up. Five, six, seven, eight. I'm still seeing hands up. Nine, ten, eleven. Oh my goodness, twelve, thirteen. This is getting serious. Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. I still have two hands up. Nineteen. All right. Sharon, how many do you have? You just kept your hand up. All right. There's no cash prize we're giving out or anything, Sharon. You know? Well, okay. The Krauses, how many? 17. Anybody top that? 17. Let's give them a hand. Oh, what, what you got? What, what, what? When my mom passed away, she had 145. Uh, when your mom passed away, 145 grandchildren, great and great, great grandchildren. We won't try to top that one, but 17's a good number. Let's give them a hand. That's awesome. We love that. <clears throat> oh, I've been looking forward to this weekend as we kick off a three-week message series on an amazing book in the Bible that's some of the greatest literature in the Bible. Uh, unusual story. There's only two books in the Bible named after women, and Ruth obviously is one of them, but the other is Esther, okay? And Ruth has another distinction in that this is the only book in the Old Testament named after a non, someone born a non-Jewish person. So that's, that's pretty unusual to have an Old Testament book named after someone who's not uh, a Jewish person by, by birth and by lineage. So what is this book doing in the Bible anyway? I mean, uh, it sits there between Judges and 1 Samuel. Uh, why do we have this unique story of these women? It's a love story in ways, but it's really a, a tragedy. In fact, uh, I run a risk here today because uh, this is meant to be told in one setting or read in one setting, and we're dividing up under three weeks. There's a real risk that I can leave you all very depressed after today, because this is the bad news portion of the book of, of Ruth. And, and, and there's a, not a spoiler alert, but there's a happy ending here. But why do we need to tell this story? You know, when uh, important people in the Bible are born, it is not unusual to have a nativity story, a birth story, where they come from, the unusual events that surrounded their birth, the fulfillment of God's promises. The supreme example, of course, is Jesus. In the New Testament, we have Matthew and Luke give us the nativity of Jesus, the, where he comes from, and, and the story of his birth. But Luke also gives us John the Baptist has a nativity story. 
Uh, Isaac has a nativity story. Um, Moses has a nativity story. Samuel has a nativity story. Even Samson, who's kind of a knucklehead, gets a nativity story. But don't you think it's strange that David doesn't get a nativity story? Where did he come from? You know, we just meet him. He's a punk kid watching his father's sheep, and we don't really get the story of his birth being anything special. Well, this is a great topic for Grandparents Weekend because the unique and God-fulfilling, prophecy-fulfilling promise and, and miracle that associated with the birth of, of David actually happens with his great-grandmother, Ruth, is the great-grandmother of David. And that's really why this story is in the Bible, because of that association. It was a family story passed down through the generations, and this real significance wasn't known till later when David, the first king of, of Israel, um, happens. And this is what I want grandparents to remember today, that you may have a legacy that's bigger than what you will ever know in your lifetime. Through your children, through your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. Grandparents are legacy builders. They pass the torch of faith down to uh, the future generation. And you don't know what God is going to do through your faithfulness. You plant the seeds, and you'll be there to watch some of them uh, produce fruit. But they're going to continue to produce fruit even after you're gone. And that's the gift of, of legacy. That's the gift of, of grandparenting. You're really changing the world far beyond your life. You, you will outlive your life through your grandchildren. And of course, there's eternity at, at, at stake as well. And so we're going to jump into this uh, amazing story together. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Lord, we love your word. Uh, we need your Holy Spirit's help today. Fill me with your Holy Spirit to preach this word with unction and clarity and power. And I pray that you would anoint our ears to hear and our hearts to receive the seed of your word. That it would produce 30, 60, 100 fold for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to try not to depress you too much, but this starts out as a very sad story. Let's look at verse 1 here. In the days when the judges... Ruled. Who were the judges? Now, um, judges, I don't want you to think black robe and gavel. I want you to think of people that God sprung up to deliver Israel in their time of trouble. And so the time of the judges starts with the death of Joshua, who brings the people of Israel across the Jordan River into the Promised Land and through their early conquest of the land. And this time of the judges goes through the reign of Saul, Israel's first king. Okay, so this time there was no central government. There was no central leader. Uh, oftentimes Israel fell into sin, needed somebody to deliver them. And so God would raise up uh, some people that would, would be military leaders or political leaders for the time being. And Deborah is an example. Samson is an example. Gideon is an example. And if you read the book of, Josh, of Judges, which immediately precedes Ruth, you'll think you are reading a story about the wild, wild west. And that's really what it was. I tell you what, some of the bloodiest, most violent stories you will ever read in the Bible are in the book of Judges. You will slap your forehead when you're reading this and say, did this really happen? This is horrible. Why am I even reading? This is a horrible story. And, um, and, and there were times when one tribe turned on another. In fact, the last story that's told in the book of Judges is the 11, 11 of the tribes of Israel got together against Benjamin and almost completely wiped the tribe of Benjamin out. And the last verse in the book of Judges, the last verse we read before we get to Ruth, is in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Now, for us Americans, that sounds pretty good, right? not it? No king, 1776, right? Uh, and everybody gets to do what they want to do. That is not meant as a positive statement in the scriptures. It's meant as a cry from Israel's heart. They need a king. You know, um, I like the idea of limited government. You know, that we don't have an all in we don't have a, somebody that's just micromanaging every part of our life. I like that we don't live in a, that we live in a democracy. We don't live in a, in a dictatorship and such. The, the Bible 
says that government is ordained by God. <laughs> even, even government you don't like, like, uh, like you know, hey, uh, honor Caesar. Not that he's a great guy or anything, but government is ordained by God. And I think it's really the people that determine the kind of government that we need. One of the founding fathers says this constitution that we're writing, it's only going to work with a religious people. Because if people do not govern themselves, somebody else has to govern them. If we are not self-ruled, then we will be ruled by somebody else. And we can have an interesting discussion on how America is doing with that. If we're, you know, are we, are we passing the test there? There's a fast, I won't try to get into that today. We've got too much to talk about. But Israel was certainly failing that test. They needed a king. They needed a king. And God was going to give them a king through an uh, interesting series of events that would take a long time. And this is going to be part of that story. There was a famine in the land. Now, sometimes the Bible will say, and God caused the famine. It doesn't tell us that. It just says there was a famine. And a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Uh, Bethlehem, this is a, you know, Bethlehem is a little town. I spent three nights in Bethlehem this year. That was a blessing. And of course, Bethlehem is famous for lots of reasons, you know, going back to Jacob, buried Rachel, his wife Rachel in, in Bethlehem. And of course, David later comes from Bethlehem. There's lots of mentions. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a very big place, but a very, very historic place. And it literally means house of bread. That's what the name Bethlehem means. And so the irony here is that the house of bread has no bread. You know, the old mother Hubbard's cupboards are, are, are bare. And so a man that lived in Bethlehem because of the famine makes a decision to move his wife, two sons, family of four, uh, from Bethlehem to Moab. Everybody say yuck. That's what we're supposed to read when we see Moab. Moab. Uh, let me tell you what the people of Israel believed through Scripture was the deal with Moab. Uh, the origins of Moab are described in the uh, book of Genesis. Lot, you know, lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, and God brought him out with an angel, and his, he lost his wife because she turned back and looked at God's destruction, and so he ended up uh, outside of Sodom and Gomorrah and had two daughters, and the shameful story that's told in Scripture is these two daughters wanted to have kids, didn't have any prospects for a husband. They got their dad drunk. And that's where Moab is one of the sons that resulted in that drunken, incestuous, sinful, you know, not a very, that, that's how they describe. Here, if you want to know where Moab comes from, that's where they come from, okay? And the next thing we read about Moab is when the children of Israel came uh, out of the slavery in Egypt, they wanted to pass through, uh, Moab. we've got a little map we can put up on the, on the screen, they wanted to pass through to, um, to the promised land and they, they went to Balak, king of Moab, and said, we just want to pass through, you know, we're not going to bother anything, not going to eat anything, not going to drink anything, we're just, going to, we're just going to zip on through. He would not let them. In fact, he was so scared of them and intimidated of them. That, um, that he hired a prophet by the name of Balaam to curse Israel. And Balaam, uh, signed, you know, went with them. And there's a whole big story along with that. It's in the book of Numbers. But when Balaam went to curse Israel, God would only let him bless Israel. And so he, he was started to speak curses and God would speak through him blessing. And so he said, I, I just can't do it. God won't let me do that. But there's something called the sin of Balaam that's even mentioned in the book of Revelation. What Balaam did is he took the king, um, the king of Moab aside and he said, well, if you really want to really conquer the Israelites, don't send your armies over there. Send your women. Get a little party going. Because if you can separate Israel from their God and the holy laws of their God, you will conquer them from within. And that is exactly what they did. And Israel got into sin through this. And so not only did Moab have this terrible reputation, but especially Moabite women had a bad reputation 
with the Israelites. And so, you know, one thing we know about the Jewish people and their land is they're tied very closely. It must have taken something very, very strong, a bad famine, to get, uh, to get this family to say, we're going to leave the land of promise, the land flowing with what did Moses say? Milk and honey. And, and now we're in this type of famine. And so basically they are doing the exodus in reverse here. They are crossing the Jordan about where Israel crossed into the promised land. They are crossing out of the promised land. And they are going down across the river Arnon into this land of Moab. Let's continue this story in uh, Ruth chapter 1. The man's name was Elimelech. And his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and they lived there. Now, um, this is a tragic story, and the storytelling here is going to be terse, staccato. Um, it's almost like what you would get if you watch a movie, and it's a dystopian future that it's set in, and there's kind of a voiceover, you know, that talks about how bad things are. You know, America has been destroyed. North Korea is in control. A race of robot chickens has been bred to rule over the people. Or well, whatever it is, you know. You, you get that kind of storytelling. That's what the author here of, of, of Ruth is going to give us. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. You know, it, it's, it's, to lose your life partner, okay, is a, is, a, is a very, very tragic thing. I watched my mom go, my dad died when he was 52, and I was 21 and watched my mom go through that grieving process. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that's probably multiplied when you're living out away from your network of extended family and relatives in the place you grew up. You're a stranger in a strange land. How vulnerable did Naomi feel at this point? Uh, you know, they, they moved hoping for the best. And now, and now Elimelech dies. <laughs> And she was left with her two sons. And she tries to make a living for them. And she, they, they're old enough to get married. And she needs them to be married and have a family. And so she finds, negotiates with two Moabite women. They married Moabite women. One named, not Oprah, Orpah. And the other, Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died. So... You know, sometimes the Bible will tell, well, okay, they were sinful and God killed them. It doesn't give any kind of divide agency here. It just says they died. We don't know what happened to them. But um, both her sons died. You know, losing a child, is, it's a very different kind of grief. And I'm not qualified to speak of it. Other than as a pastor, I've watched people move through it or try to move through it. It's a very, very difficult thing. Only those who have lived it are qualified. But all I can say is when you get married you kind of acknowledge, even in the vows, that your spouse may die. Till death do us part. In other words, the, the preacher says, how this marriage is going to legitimately end is one of you is going to bury the other one. We don't like to think about it. We hope for many, many years before that happens. But that's how marriages end. You're, you're kind of aware of that. None of us have the equipment to bury our children. That's just a whole different thing. And that's a nightmare. And uh, the grief is a, of a whole different kind uh, to, lose, to lose a child. And, um, and, and this is compounded by the fact that it's both sons. I tell you what, in this culture, um, heritage and the continuation of family was everything. Absolutely everything. And what this these tw double death means is that her family line story was going to end. This, it would end with her. And the Jewish people were so uh, passionate about continuing family lines. There were some weird ways that they did it. You know, if, uh, if a, a man died and left a widow, and the widow had no children, then the, the law of Moses said the brother is to step in and do his level best to get that widow pregnant. Say, ick. This, these are different, this is a different culture than what we live in, okay? Do his best. And the kids that she has, the 
will be the, the continuation of the family line of the brother, okay? So they would go to great lengths, even things we would consider bizarre, to continue family lines. And this, even that option is not open here, okay? Both brothers are, are dead. Both sons are dead. And Naomi is left without her sons and, and, and her husband. This is a, uh, this is a story of, of loss. Now, I, I, I just can't help but point out that our church has been through a season of loss. Can we just name that? Can we talk about that? Is that okay? We, we have been through a season of loss. And I tell you what, we might have different opinions on who did what and when they, and, and whatever happened. But let me tell you what, all of us are feeling the loss, the loss for people we love, relationships and staff members and and, um, um, and, and that, I tell you what, that, that's the kind of thing that shakes you. Uh, this week, uh, Yvette and I jumped on a Zoom call with the folks at Spirit and Truth in Dayton, Ohio. That's a group that's coming to visit us in the weekend before Thanksgiving in November to do the Awakening Weekend. And so they've already been praying for us as a church, and they're coming in, and we're going to have a, a whole weekend of Holy Spirit and prayer. It's going to be beautiful. But I felt like I should just tell them, since they've been praying for us, that we've been going through some stuff as a church. And so I just took about five minutes, and I said, well, this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and then this happened. And they listened to me, and they're like, oh, my goodness, wow, that's crazy. You know, um, and they're praying for us and, 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 and all of that, and that's a, God's working. But I tell you what, when you're in this moment, you don't see what God's up to. And, I, you know, we take some tries. Well, maybe God was pruning this or changing this, or maybe there was the Holy Spirit was moving through. Or maybe the enemy was attacking here. Or, you know, we just, what, 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 you know. We're just, we're just scrambling. When you're in it, you can't see anything but the loss, okay? And we've kind of been living this around here. So it's different, but there's some similarities here. Let's read on. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughter-in-law prepared to return home from there. Now, um, Ruth is in, I mean, Naomi is in Moab. She has heard probably through traders or people that travel that things are better in Bethlehem. There is bread in the house of bread. And, um, and she, of course, feels very vulnerable and feels like she needs to get back home to her own people. And the reason they left is no longer there. So um, they get ready to, uh, to go back. Now, to really understand this, and you've got to understand a little bit about Near Eastern culture, with her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had, not, had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Now, um, th these are kind of the laws of hospitality that really govern this society. And it was really part of the culture I grew up in as well, less so today. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember this. When you had company and they got ready to leave, you did your level best to try to talk them out of leaving. Okay? It was just polite. And when they went out the door, you didn't just wave it. You just didn't let them go out the door. You went out with them, right? And you went out to the car, and you talked a little bit, and you tried to invite them back in. This is what polite, this is not a Southern Illinois thing, right? This is just what you did, right? This is what you did. And you might even walk down the driveway as they pull out, and you'd stand on the curb, and, and you'd wave. You'd wave at them, Right? And, and you'd, stay, you'd stand there and wave until they could no longer see you waving in their rearview mirror. That seems straight, but am I lying? You, that's what you did. That's what you did. And I don't think the expectation here is that these two daughters-in-law are going to go with her all the way back to Israel, but she probably wanted to leave so they wouldn't beg her to stay. And they pretended politely that they were all going to go together. But she gets to the point where, okay, you know, this is, this is a good point to stop. And she... And she says, um, uh, let's see, then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. This is the only place where it describes it as a mother's home. Usually it's your father's home. So we could talk about that. That's interesting. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. 
May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. So she's invoking the name of Yahweh over them. God bless you um, for, for your kindness. Bless you for how you've served your husband, my, your dead husbands, my sons. And may you, each, may you remarry. May you find, there's still time for you, may you find a new husband. Go home. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud, these three widows, and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. This was the polite thing to say. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? The answer is no. Uh, return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me. Uh, even if I pulled off a, a Sarah here, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, you, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. We're going to see that word bitter again before the end of this, uh, end of this chapter. God's hand's turned against me. Let's read on. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Orpah does the reasonable thing. She goes back home, uh, misses her mother-in-law, but uh, is going to start a new life. Ruth hangs on. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. Go back and do the Moabite thing. But Ruth replied, now these are some of the most famous words in the Bible, and I've got a little fun fact here about this. When Becky and I got married 35 years ago, uh, a, a, a guy named Larry Durfee officiated our wedding. He was kind of a mentor guy in our lives. And, um, and, and he did our premarital counseling. And he said, I've got a wedding service that's all scripture." That's based all on the word of God. So that sounds great. He wanted to use this particular wedding ceremony. So when Becky and I got married, these were Becky's vows to me. These words I'm getting ready to read. Now my aunt Kay thought that was really weird. Okay. That Becky would say to me what Ruth said to Naomi. But you're going to see here a description of what the Bible calls in the Old Testament in Hebrew, hesed. Covenant love, faithful love. And this is what Ruth says. Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. We've got a new Jewish proselyte right now, right here, okay? Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord, she's invoking the name of Israel's God, deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Okay, what's going on here? You know, the mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship is notoriously difficult. There's a reason why there's a whole genre of humor called mother-in-law jokes. And we won't tell any of them here because they're not very sanctified. But there can be tension in the mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship because um, your meatloaf isn't the same as mama used to make, okay? And who is this woman anyway coming and taking my baby from me and becoming his primary person now when I was the primary person at, at one time and I'm the one that raised this kid and, and changed his diapers and wiped his nose and, and kissed his boo-boos and all that and now somebody else is taking my place. And so, you know, that, that's, that's fraught with emotion and conflict and maybe you've experienced that in your own life in some way but I tell you what this is good that sometimes it's not like losing a son sometimes it's gaining a daughter okay it's beautiful when it happens it's not a slam dunk guarantee but it's beautiful when it happens and Ruth is showing an example of extraordinary loyalty 
to someone that it was not required culturally that she be this devoted to, okay? In either Israelite or Moabite culture. Uh, she's doing something extraordinary, and she invokes Israel's God. Did she start become a believer in Israel's God through the witness and the stories that were told by through Malon and Kilion and Elimelech and, and Naomi, there was something there that drew her uh, away from the false gods of the Moabites, uh, the God of, of Israel. And even though she realizes that there's a really good chance that she's going to be a pariah in Bethlehem, that she's not going to be accepted, she's going to be a Moabite woman that's come into the Jewish territory. She says, I'm going to do that. And your people are my people, even if they don't see me as their people. And your God is my God. And I'm going to live with you, and I'm going to die with you, and our graves are going to be adjacent to one another. That is an amazing act of loyalty. Okay. Um, so the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Let me tell you what, you don't see much in a small town, but you, what you hear in a small town makes up for it. Everybody knows everybody's business, and, uh, and everybody heard that Naomi was back. It was big news, it was a big deal, and they are running out to greet Naomi. And Naomi, I think she realizes here that she is going to be an object lesson. Somebody's sermon the next Sabbath might be, told you not to go to Moab. Told you not to marry your sons off to Moabite women. This is what happens. You know, here's an example. Just look at, look, look at what happened to Naomi. That's, that's what happens when you spurn God's law, when you don't take advice of Scripture. This is... I mean, she was totally open to that. I mean, she's totally, she knew that that's what she faced. Don't call me Naomi. Naomi means something like pleasant, okay? Don't call me pleasant, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty, that means bitter, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. She doesn't give the name of God there. She gives a title for God, El Shaddai. We sing that sometimes, El Shaddai. And El Shaddai literally means mighty-breasted one, okay? Have you ever had, you know, sometimes guys will give other guys a big bear hug, just kind of pick them up, you know? Have you ever had a guy that benches about 480, chest out to here, just reach in and just give you a bear to squeeze the life out of you there? That's what, that's El Shaddai, potent. Strong, all-powerful, almighty, mighty-breasted one. And the almighty one has used his might against me. God has weaponized his strength against me. That is what she's saying. She's bitter. Loss will make you bitter. And, uh, and she is assuming that this is... And she's not saying God's wrong about this, okay? Okay. She's just saying, God's turned against me. And, and there's reasons why that might have happened in her mind, that God would question the, the decisions that her family made, the choices they made to leave Israel. God's brought me back, um, God's brought me back empty. You know, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come in for a landing here. It's so such good stuff, so, so much here. I've, I've, I've sat through lots of talks, theologians and others that have said, God is either all powerful or he's all good, but he can't be both. Because if God is all powerful, look at all the evil in the world that he allows to happen. That means God's not all good. And if God is all good, that must mean that he's not all powerful because a good God wouldn't let the things happen in the world that are happening under his watch. And to that argument, I say hogwash. God is all-powerful, 
and God is all good. What those that say that can't, can't be both, what they leave out is the element of time. God is good all the time. And if things aren't good, that means that God's not done. Okay? God is good. And if things aren't good, that means that God's not done yet. My dad would play checkers with me, and he was a far, infinitely better checkers player than I was. And he let me free will. He let me make every move I wanted to make on the board. And it was just how long he was going to let me go before he... Doom, 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 doom. It was a foregone conclusion. But in that, he let me make all the decisions that I wanted to make, and it was just an issue of time. You will face some loss in this world. And let me tell you, you know, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God's got all of eternity to make it up to you. Okay? I'm not saying that the losses aren't real. They won't shake your soul. I'm not saying they won't make you bitter at times. But the good thing about what Naomi is saying here is she's still in relationship with God. She's assuming that God's judgment is upon her, but she's still in relationship. She's coming back to the land of that God. She's coming back into relationship with him even though. And Job said, though he slay me, yet I will serve him. And there's some points in, in, in our faith journey where it's, I, this does not make sense to me. I don't understand what's going on. But I'm going to stay on the journey. I'm going to stay in faith. I'm going to stay loyal to God. And I'm going to stick on the, on the journey with him. You know, Ruth and Naomi died. They died knowing that their story had a happy ending. Okay. They didn't know how happy. <laughs> it would be three generations later that someone would write down this story. And this is how the king of Israel came in. But let me tell you what. It would be another thousand years. Thousand years. That somebody named Matthew would sit down to write the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. And he would start with a lineage of how this Messiah came to us. And it's mostly male names there. But he pauses every once in a while and talks about five times. He mentions five women that are in that lineage. Guess what? Guess who makes it in? To, the, to that lineage of Jesus Christ a thousand years later, it's Ruth, the, the Moabite. And she stands back there. We see her as a figure. Guess what? who, who the Moabites are? Us. I, the, the, the glory of the new covenant is I'm a Moabite, you're a Moabite, and we've been grafted into this long arc story of salvation history that brought us Jesus Christ. And they can't see it from where they're standing. And we can't see it from where we're standing always. You just have Naomi standing humbly before all her old friends and saying, I went away full. God probably back empty. God probably back with nothing. And there's the little Ruth standing four paces back awkwardly. Nothing here. Nothing. She's got nothing. Let me introduce you to nothing. But let me tell you what. God's going to work with these two women with a whole lot of nothing. And uh, with weak faith or maybe even adversarial faith. And God's going to do something beautiful and bigger than just blow their minds. That they wouldn't see until the other side of eternity. Stand up so I'll stop talking. You would have stood up a long time ago if you had known. Anybody bitter today? Bitter of soul. The losses you don't understand. You have no idea what God's up to. Lord God, we thank you that you have grafted us mole bites in to this story of salvation. Through our Savior Jesus Christ and his great, 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 great grandma, Ruth. Thank you for this love story that's going to follow, the redemption. The word redeem is going to be used over 20 times in this book. 
And we thank you, God, that when we don't understand, we can hang on to the fact that you're a redeeming God. In Jesus' name.